Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to John for having us. So the changes that have occurred in large cell lymphoma have come over a number of years and throughout my career, but are slow. Reminding you that in 1992, we published the large randomized forearm study of large cell lymphoma that confirmed that about a third of the patients could be treated and cured of their disease. But progression-free was about 35%. Overall survival, however, was about 40 to 45%. How could that be? Well, if your overall survival is better than your early uh, survival, then you must have salvage therapy. And of course, this was due to autologous stem cell transplant, at that time bone marrow transplant, which added another 5 to 10%. But that was 1992. And it was almost 10 years later before anything happened. And the new thing that happened, of course, in the French GILA study and confirmed in the American North American study was that rituxan was added in a simple fashion to our CHOP and voila, 15% increment in survival. So now we had about 60% overall survival in this uh, group of patients. And that governs what you have to do when you begin to think about adding uh, new agents. The only exception to this, I think, that could be called progress, and we won't push this because it's a bit in the eye of the beholder, was the intergroup transplant study, which we conducted. And the question there was, if transplant could salvage patients, was it better to treat them up front with transplant? Since it was a relatively costly and toxic regimen, you would only do that if there was a lot of benefit. So this was delayed transplant at relapse for only those who need it, i.e. relapse patients, versus up front for all patients in the high intermediate and high IPI group. And in fact, what you see, as transplant frequently does, was there's an easy yield first off, and that's progression-free survival. So that was good, but for the overall population, overall survival was not changed. So that wasn't so good. In an unplanned subsequent subset analysis, there were two different groups in here, the high intermediate by the IPI and the high risk. And if you looked at those two on the right, the high risk, and on the left, the lower of the high intermediate groups, lower risk compared to the one on the right, basically you see that there's a significant difference in that the transplant appeared to help those patients who had high risk data. And based on that, at least some transplanters in the field have adopted our data and said that it should be standard of care. Uh, I actually won't push that one way or the other at this point in time. Now, the question of a dose-adjusted epoch has been around for many years, probably more than a decade now. And in fact, we have been waiting for many, many years for the results of this randomized trial. It closed when, John? A while ago. A while ago. <laughs> John can't remember when this closed. We're run by his group. And it is a randomized trial of RCHOP versus dose-adjusted epoch R in patients up front untreated uh, large cell lymphoma. And of course, my bias is that the longer we have to wait to report the data, we are waiting for something to happen. Because sooner or later, something will happen. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet, and it hasn't come out yet. And any time I say this, which I've been saying for the last five years, I expect someone to say, it's coming, it's coming, and we'll hope so. But at the moment, we have no comparative data that compares RCHOP to dose-adjusted EPOC in a randomized fashion. So RCHOP remains the standard initial therapy for patients with advanced stage diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, this is a, when I was a, a visiting professor and I was leading the Italian lymphoma team, and I thought I looked pretty good. And then I remembered Photoshop. Uh, but it has one of my aphorisms, and the aphorism I taught them there is just because you have a problem, i.e. we can't cure all the patients, doesn't mean you have a solution. And so the question is, is there something we can do to increase the cure rate in these patients? I will remind you again, 10 years keeps coming up. It was 10 years ago when we first published with the molecular profiling group the first gene arrays in these patients, which clearly showed on fresh frozen tissue that the genetics of these diseases were separate, and anyone who has pattern recognition can understand that there were two different groups by gene expression, one looking like an activated B cell and one looking like a germinal center B cell. And in fact, the exciting thing was that there seemed to be a difference in biology, and that was that the germinal centers seemed to do better than the activated B cells, and that has been reproduced. 
Now, the IPI, which we worked on back in the 90s, was a very important index, but it had clinical factors that were non-changeable, age, sex, stage, LDH, et cetera, not easily modified. The hope here was that because the genomics were different, that we had things we could target and would be, in fact, different. And it was reassuring to see that different genomic pathways were present in the germinal center B and the activated B, and you can see that. And therefore, a whole series of drugs were developed in the second part of this debate, will the new agents make an impact? And in fact, you see many of these are involved and listed here. It turns out by no predefined mechanism that the activated B has the more candidates. They follow the NF-kappa B pathway, bortezomib being the original champion of NF-kappa B inhibition, and they go down through a variety of agents. There are fewer in the germinal center B. So most of the activity is going to be focused on the patients who had the worst prognosis of the two groups and for whom there are more new drugs. And in fact, unfortunately, if the new drugs and the novel agents and the targeted kinase inhibitors, if you look at their single agent activity across the board in patients who have relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma, they're not very exciting. They're 20 to 30 percent drugs and not a lot of CRs. So if you believe, which may not be true in the old paradigms, that you had to have a lot of CRs to get a, a therapeutic benefit, this was not very encouraging. Now, we did learn a lot of biology, and particularly in the activated B cells, they are activated through the B cell receptor, and in fact, the tumor cells require signaling through this immunoglobulin receptor to be able to survive. Therefore, teleologically, if you could interrupt that pathway, you would think you might be able to kill the tumor. And in fact, in some early work done with the cell lines, where the germinal center cell lines can be separated from the activated B cells, when you use bortezomib as an NF-kappa B inhibitor, predicted it would work only in the activated B, and in fact it did. So this is cell line data supporting the concept that interrupting the B cell receptor is important. And now, one of the things you're probably going to hear uh, in the next talk is this small, very small, let me repeat, very small study uh, from the NCI with 27 patients, which basically looked at relapsed refractory patients treated with bortezomib and EPOC, I think are, but I'm not 100 percent sure. It doesn't say that on this slide. I forget off the top of my head. And the bottom line is, in this relapsed population, the activated B cells did different. So if you think in general throughout their course, activated B does worse than germinal center B, this is a little bit of indication that maybe something good is happening with these inhibitors. But it's a challenge to do these studies. It's a challenge because as we make rare diseases and subdivide, the technology gets harder and harder. And so if you want to do an RCHOP plus or minus bortezomib, you can go down here and see in the very bottom that you'd have to screen 360 patients to get 82 patients randomized per arm, which would give you a chance of seeing a 20 percent improvement. So these are not faint of heart studies to conduct when you have subsets like this. Now, actually, the study's been done. This is a study in which we have a combination of basically RCHOP and RCHOP with bortezomib. It's a little bit called VRCHOP because bortezomib and vincristine have overlapping neurotoxicity, and so you have to kind of take the vincristine out to be able to put the bortezomib in. But this is a comparison where you would expect in the activated B cell patients that you would see a difference. And the results of that study, as they say, unfortunately, when you don't need a statistician to analyze your data, it's probably not a positive study. And this one is as close as it gets. And so there was no benefit of bortezomib in this. Now, there are second and third generations coming along, and they might be better, and there might be different ways to inhibit B-cell receptor signaling, but at the core of it, at the NF-kappa B endpoint, with bortezomib, no evidence of a major impact whatsoever. Now, further downstream, there's a drug called abrutinib, which you all know about. It is a very good inhibitor, but it turns out, strangely enough, that suddenly CLL and mantle cell become poster children. But if you look all the way over to the right, large cell lymphoma, two out of seven, no CRs, pretty darn anemic. So again, one would predict, but don't know, that the possibility of adding a brutinib might not be earth-shattering. 
it is good to know that in relapse refractory, a brutinib does lead to some responses and that they weren't seen in the germinal center B. So that's following the genetic phenotype we saw and needed. That's good. And then finally, we come to something called lenalidomide. Now, I don't know where to put lenalidomide in terms of mechanism of action because it has multiple mechanisms of action. It can have NK cell action, T cell effect, microenvironment effect, and direct tumor effect. If you think back to many years ago, it kind of sounds like we talked about rituximab and we still didn't figure out how rituximab was going to work. But lenalidomide or Revlimid does have single agent activity and all of us have some patient. I have one who I sent to hospice and came back three months later smiling at me and saying, why had I done that? And when we looked at him, his disease hadn't all gone away, but it had shrunk some and he was stable and he lived for a year and a half. That's anecdotal and it doesn't happen to everyone but it can happen. So maybe this will be the breakthrough drug to add. And there is some data, not in a randomized fashion, mostly from the Mayo Clinic, and this is where they took what they now call R-squared, which means Revlimid and uh, Rituximab CHOP. And one of the problems in these studies is that the genomic data we showed you, which is very true, is all done in fresh frozen tissue. And the pathologists have then tried to do immunohistochemistry, which is my least favorite test in the pathology world because it's subject to interpretation and quite variable. And the pathologists have gone through algorithms, which this one is shown here, but it, it really doesn't matter. They're about 80 and 90 percent accurate. That's good when you're doing population studies. It may not be good enough when you're selecting individual patients to change their treatment and giving them drugs that won't work if you get it wrong. Okay. So uh, this I'm going to skip for the moment. This is the result of the studies, and they suggest in a historical comparison that R-squared lenalidomide is going to be an improvement. There are now studies going on with all of these agents. This is from the NCI outline of studies going on. So there's the, the bortezomib study is done. There's a, lenal, there's a lenalidomide study. There's an abrutinib study. There's every one of these new agents going on in some fashion around the world, but as of yet, there is no randomized data. And then let me give you a point of caution, which I think is very important. One, don't think you can take these targeted agents and put them with RCHOP and have a happy result without knowing the toxicity ahead of time. These agents have their own unique toxicities. Some of them are very important. I noticed that uh, they didn't mention in the last question session the recent idelisib toxicity in black box warning that's coming out, which was, of course, a fatality due to pulmonary infection. So you have to be very careful when you're combining these things. And in my review, some of which is published, some of which is confidential at this moment, every one of these new combination targeted agents plus RCHA has higher toxicity, and it probably has to be that way. And the question, therefore, is it worth it? Therefore, the therapeutic benefit maybe must be even bigger because you're going to pay a price in toxicity. So we'll see how that comes around. But at this moment, I can say I don't see it. So what are the residual issues? Well, we, we want to take away the chemotherapy to get in this agent. We can still cure 60 percent of the patients or 40 percent, depending on the subset. That's a spicy meatball. We need better biomarkers to really predict who's going to be in the ABCGCB, and some of that is coming along. Nanostring may get there, not commercially available yet. Combinations, you got to really do the phase one and phase twos. Untoward toxicity can raise its ugly head. And how do you get these combinations approved? And then finally, when you do use that, who's going to pay for it? And in, in Philadelphia, it's IBC, is, is the Blue Cross representative, and they're not really happy when we are spending close to a million dollars on some agents of targeted agents going along. So it's a tough question. I'm going to skip this and simply say, should we treat patients with DLBCL different? I don't know. There is no prospective evidence saying you can make them better by any combination other than using RCHOP. Maybe EPOC-R will turn out to be better, who knows. Maybe RCHOP or EPOC-R plus something will come out, but the candidates are falling as we work our way through them, and there aren't that many left. So I think at the moment we have ad hoc, we should not be doing it. But without question, what we have to do 
is conduct these large-scale randomized trials so that, in fact, we can hopefully develop the next rituximab to add in this combination. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention.